All right, guys, we're going to do a quick uh, run through of aquatic biomes. Now, remember this, since we're doing biome projects, I'm not going to go into massive detail about any of these because you're going to see videos from your peers and we'll fill in a few things from there. But this is sort of the overview of what most of the aquatic biomes are. Um, aquatic biomes in general are categorized by different properties. Our, our old way of doing or our way of doing terrestrial biomes where it's essentially temperature, you know, area, temperature, and then precipitation. That doesn't apply in the same way for aquatic biomes because precipitation doesn't really matter in the same way because if there are aquatic biomes where there's a lot of water there anyway, then the precipitation level doesn't matter as much. Now, and, and the temperature does matter. Um, but what matters more, we're going to see are these things that we're going to categorize them by. So there's salinity. So we're essentially going to make a big divide between freshwater and marine. Um, their depth. So are they shallow enough that plants can grow in them um, and grow out of them and emerge out of them? Or are they so deep that, that plants are pretty much going to be under the surface and, and therefore the animals and the other consumers? Um, water flow, is the water moving constantly or is the water sort of static and still? Um, and th those first three are the main ones. And then we've got a bunch of other stuff that, that does matter but isn't really how we classify the biome. So stuff like um, oxygen content, uh, dissolved oxygen in the water, um, how much light and where the light can penetrate to, and then the food and nutrients that are available. So again, we're going to split these up into freshwater and marine biomes, or sometimes they're called aquatic life zones. A lot of times aquatic um, type ecosystems aren't really referred to as biomes, but either way is going to be fine. Um, so we've got freshwater ones. We've got lakes and rivers, streams, ponds, um, inland wetlands, or freshwater wetlands, we'll call them. Um, and then marine organisms, oceans and bays, essentially the same things. I mean, bays are essentially... Um, oceans just in a smaller, more confined area. And it does have some effect on the, the wildlife there, but not a massive effect. It's still essentially part of the ocean, much like the Gulf would be, um, in the Gulf of Mexico would be. Um, the areas around the shore, the coastal areas, so coastal wetlands, um, coral reefs, estuaries, and these sort of special things called mangrove forests. So real briefly, um, streams and rivers, I mean, the essential characteristic there, obviously, is that the water is flowing. Um, and that flowing water typically comes from two places. So you've either got it uh, generating from a, from a spring somewhere, an underground spring where there's an aquifer, and there's a spring that's releasing its water to the surface, um, or, as is probably more commonly the case, runoff from rain and melting snow, and you've got watersheds that feed into some sort of stream or river system. We're going to go into a lot of detail for that. Um, later on, we talk about uh, water and watersheds, and it's really important for us, obviously, in... Um, East Tennessee, because since we're, you know, the TVA basically controls our river system here um, in, a, in a pretty dramatic way. It's one of the most controlled uh, bodies of water, large bodies of water um, in the world. Um, and streams and rivers are pretty dynamic communities because as the flow changes, things change for them. And so if you've got a relatively slow moving river, um, then you're going to have a lower dissolved oxygen content. And so you're going to tend to get um, different organisms. So for instance, you're going to get like maybe stuff like catfish um, that thrives on low amounts of dissolved oxygen. Whereas if you've got a much more quickly flowing stream or a river that's flowing over some rapids, that turbulence and all the stirring up of the water in it and air going into it gets more dissolved oxygen in there. And so that's going to give the opportunity um, for more different kinds of life forms um, in those more uh, turbulent waters. So as the, as the flow changes, it's going to change um, the life forms in the community around them um, as well. Um, we've got lakes and ponds. Um, lakes and ponds, how, how are they differentiated from streams and rivers? And again, that's kind of hard for us because you look at Fort Loudon Lake there for us, but it's essentially part of the Tennessee River system as well. So what's the difference here? Um, well, typically, it's, it's really a lake or a pond if, if the freshwater is not really moving or moving extremely slowly. Um, and there has to be a point at which they're so deep that uh, vegetation can't grow up from the bottom. And so real briefly, I want to go over the zones here because this is going to be important for not, not just for lakes um, and ponds, but for the ocean as well. And so you've got these areas here. You've got a littoral zone. Um, the littoral zone you can think of as kind of like the shallow area. And this is where um, there are plants growing in it. And in fact, the plants might be able to actually break through um, and grow up through the surface. That's in the littoral zone. 
In the limnetic zone, you're a little bit further out, and there might be plants growing, but they're not growing tall enough to actually break through the water. And so you've got the limnetic zone is actually broken up into other zones. You've got what we call the photic zone. The photic zone basically means light can penetrate. And so obviously in that area, you've got a much greater chance of having plants, okay? Because if there's no light there, the plants aren't going to be able to survive. And therefore, if there's more plants, there's going to be more life overall in that type of area. Um, and then at the bottom, you have a deep water zone, an aphotic zone, or what's called a profundal zone, where there's no light penetrating. There's still life there. Um, there's still enough uh, nutrients drifting down from things that are dying from the open water zone that you've still got some amount of life there, but not nearly as much. And then you sort of got what we call the benthic zone, which is essentially just sort of this um, muddy um, area towards the bottom that, again, does have life. You've got a lot of bacteria and decomposers down there. Um, but certainly you don't have plant life really being able to flourish there and therefore the consumers that would then feed off of that plant life. Okay, so that is essentially lakes and ponds. Um, freshwater wetlands. So freshwater wetlands can be broken up into a variety of categories. And I'm just going to break them down into three categories for you here. Um, you could make distinctions in other ways as well. Um, essentially, if it's a freshwater wetland, it has any sort of wetland, really. A wetland has to be submerged or saturated by water for at least part of the year. It doesn't have to be the entire year, but for at least part of the year. And it has to have emergent vegetation throughout. Remember what we mean by emergent vegetation is that it can grow up through the water. Um, and again, this will apply to saltwater wetlands um, as well as freshwater wetlands. So what's the difference? Well, Freshwater wetlands are also called inland wetlands, meaning that they're inland away from the oceans so that they don't have salt water really mixed in with them. Um, so we've got three main types of them. We've got uh, swamps, and swamps are distinguished, like we, we sort of use these terms in our head sometimes as interchangeably, swamps and marshes. Um, but swamps basically have trees, okay, um, and can tend to have some really big trees. The trees are growing up um, out of the swamp, and not just a couple of trees, but a lot of trees. Okay, so like uh, Okefenokee Swamp um, in Georgia is a really good example of this. Um, a lot of the bayous down um, in Louisiana, that's swamp type area where there, you've got a lot of trees as sort of the overwhelming source of vegetation there. Uh, marshes are what, what we call areas that have non-woody vegetation. In other words, they don't really have trees. There may be some occasionally, you know, sort of spotted throughout the area but not very many trees. Um, so like for instance, uh, Central and South Florida um, are a pretty good example of this as a sort of a marshy type area. Again, there are some trees, but not as many, and they're really spaced out. It's not really like a foresty area. It's characterized by sort of the short vegetation that you would see here. Um, and then you've got bogs, and bogs are sort of like marshes with very acidic soil, and that acidic soil means that you're going to have to have uh, plants and animals, therefore, that are adapted specifically to that area. Um, so you get a lot of what we call sphagnum moss. Um, and there are areas of Europe really where bogs provide a lot of their heat source because they'll basically, um, it'll form into what's called peat and they'll just cut out sort of little blocks of it and take those out and burn them um, as their fuel source because they don't have a lot of wood around because again, bogs don't have very many trees. Occasionally there are some trees like marshes, but not nearly as many as you would have in a swamp-like area. Now, what's really important for us is that wetlands are going to provide a bunch of functions, and you guys are going to be doing projects on this, so I won't go too deep into it, but the, the, one of the primary things that wetlands are important for us is they're going to help to filter out water. Um, so water moving through the wetlands, because it does move to some degree, um, is going to get filtered out. They're also really important because there's an immense amount of biodiversity um, in these areas. You've got a lot of vegetation. I mean, you can see just sort of from the pictures that there's a lot of vegetation there, and therefore there's going to be a lot of opportunity for consumers, and then we can sort of go up that food web and that food chain up to higher and higher consumers because there's such sort of a wealth of nutrients there in those areas. Um, so let's move on to the marine um, biomes, and so the first sort of marine biome here is what's called an estuary, and I put it in the middle because estuaries are sort of a mix. Estuaries are where a river or a stream runs into salt water, runs into the oceans or into a bay or a gulf or something like that. And you get an estuary where you get what we call brackish water, where the fresh water and the salt water are mixing together. 
Um, and anytime that happens, the salinity content, obviously the salinity is salt, and so the salinity content is going to be uh, much raised, and so therefore that's going to make it much more similar to saltwater biomes or marine biomes than it is freshwater. Um, and estuaries are really productive because you get a lot of nutrients. The rivers, as they're flowing out, they're carrying a lot of nutrients uh, with them, and so you get a really productive area. Um, a really good example of this um, is the Mississippi River Delta down in uh, Louisiana where it's coming out. So the Mississippi River, obviously a giant river system carrying a massive amount of nutrients. And it, it comes out in this delta area where, the, where it's starting to meet and the water again getting brackish. But all of these nutrients are sort of getting spread out in this estuary. Um, and this is going to include what we call salt marshes. So we've got freshwater marshes. You can get marshes in these areas along the coast here where the rivers meet as well. Um, and that's going to be an estuary, type, uh, an estuary as well. Really productive as far as uh, uh, not just plant life, but wildlife as well. Um, and we get a lot of food resources from these areas as well um, in the forms of uh, fish and shellfish and stuff like that. A lot of that comes from our estuary type areas. Um, mangrove swamps are something that's kind of unique. Um, mangrove trees are one of the few large plants um, that are really salt tolerant. Um, and what that means is that they can live in salt water, and, and in fact, they thrive in salt water. And so you get these swamps, or you get these, sometimes they're called mangrove forests, these immense forested areas of these mangrove trees, and, and they look sort of like this. I know this isn't a really good picture of them, but you sort of you see where you get this, like, canopy of them, and they have these little root systems that stick down into the salt water. Um, and these are really uh, interesting and awesome areas because... They have a couple of really good purposes. They, they're going to protect the coastlines from erosion, those roots being dug down in there. They're going to protect um, the land from the battering of the ocean and the tides, constantly wanting to pull some of that sand back out and that soil back out. The mangrove swamps, their roots are going to help to keep them in. And then you can sort of imagine that this area of these root systems here makes a really good place for fish and shellfish um, to be able to thrive and live and grow. And so these mangrove swamps are really... Um, important ecosystems, um, particularly in a lot of, um, say, uh, Pacific nations, uh, island Pacific nations, these mangrove swamps become really important for them because they're sort of their source of livelihood where they're going to get a large amount of their food. Um, the intertidal zone, intertidal zone, and we'll see this when we get to the ocean slide here in a minute, but intertidal means basically you've got an area where high tide, okay, the water is really high up, and then low tide, the water go, recedes and goes back out and it exposes this area of land. And how much land is exposed kind of depends on the area. I mean, like if you're at the beach and you're like, okay, the tide is like a 30-foot area, and, and that could be true. It could only be 30 feet. But within that area, there's really actually an immense amount of, again, biodiversity in that area. Um, for instance, this is a, a picture from an intertidal zone in Norway. And you see this ridiculous amount of mussels, shellfish, um, that really thrive in these areas. Shellfish and a lot of crustaceans like crabs and stuff uh, really tend to thrive in these intertidal zones um, where the tides are constantly moving in and out. So intertidal zone um, is going to sort of, and I'll come back to the coral reefs here in a second, intertidal zone is going to sort of jump us into um, the ocean zone. And so you intertidal, you get right up here at the shoreline, okay? And then you have, just like you did in lakes, in open sea or in ocean zones, you have a photic level and an aphotic level, and you've got a benthic zone or a benthic area down on the bottom. Um, and so again, photic level is where the, the sunlight can actually reach. Um, the aphotic level or aphotic level is down at the bottom where the sunlight can actually reach. And so you get a lot of phytoplankton up top here, and then of course the phytoplankton are going to get fed on by the zooplankton. The zooplankton are going to get fed on by bigger consumers and on and on up the food chain. You know, And this is obviously where you're going to have uh, whales and sharks and stuff like that. And so even though like per unit of area, the open ocean isn't terribly productive, considering that the vast amount of our planet that is covered by ocean, as far as in terms of its biomass, there's more biomass in the open ocean than there are in other biomes. Okay. Um, again, productivity per area, smaller. Okay. But overall, you're going to get a lot more. Um, what's kind of interesting here is that the aphotic zone um, this is where we're going to see um, chemotrophs. And so at the bottom of the ocean floor, particularly where there are um, plate boundaries, um, you've got uh, these ocean vents where they're sort of jetting up this uh, hot mix of all kinds of different chemicals, particularly hydrogen sulfide. And so you get a lot of bacteria and stuff that 
that isn't getting any sunlight because we're in the aphotic zone, but it's getting a lot of chemical nutrients. And so these bacteria have adapted themselves to process those chemicals instead of processing light. They take the energy from those chemicals and make their own food sources from that. And of course, that's at the producer level. And so if you've got bacteria and stuff that are able to do that, um, then there are uh, consumers that are going to eat those producers. Most producers, of course, are what we call photoautotrophs that are up in the photic zones that are absorbing sunlight, but we've got chemoautotrophs as well um, that are going to produce food that way. And there's a whole sort of food web that uh, exists around these ocean vents, and we'll discuss some of that in class, or maybe someone um, will even want to do a, a biome project on that. Um, and last but definitely not least, um, of course, are coral reefs. Um, coral reefs are by far the most diverse uh, marine environment. Um, and basically, if you don't know what a coral reef is, coral reefs basically, the, the coral reef part means that coral, which are little organisms, um, they're going to die off. And when they die off, they leave behind these limestone skeletons. And so they form um, these reefs of these enormous uh, limestone skeletons, not of individuals, because individually they're pretty small, but they live in these communities. And so when they die off, they leave these enormous structures. Um, sort of the biggest example of this is what's called the Great Barrier Reef, and you see this moving along the coast of Australia. I want to say it's something like 28,000, or I'm sorry, 2,800 uh, kilometers long um, is this basically just this long chain um, of coral reefs here. Coral reefs are super diverse because um, there's a lot of area here. The coral, obviously, are, are part of it. Um, but there's a lot of area here where the fish can get in and hide and they can get their nutrients and then other, of course, other bigger fish are going to come through there. And we're going to watch some video and hopefully someone will do a biome project on coral reefs as well. But just a re a, an enormous amount of biodiversity um, in a coral reef. And what's really cool, and, and again, hopefully we'll get to see some of this, but the, the coral are really interesting themselves, not just because of the reefs they leave behind, but they actually exist in this mutual relationship. Um, usually coral reefs are actually not in the most nutrient-rich areas. Um, but the coral themselves, they basically have photosynthetic algae in their body. They, they have another organism inside of their body. And those photosynthetic algae are working in this mutual process where they're taking the CO2 that the coral are, are uh, basically breathing out. And the photosynthetic algae are using that and doing photosynthesis and then producing more nutrients that helps the coral to thrive even more. Um, what's uh, uh, kind of interesting here, why you hear coral reefs all the time, we're talking about environmental issues and things being endangered, is because coral reefs can only survive like in a really delicate balance of pHs and only really in very shallow, warm waters. And so any sort of temperature change um, affects them really drastically, and certainly any chemical change that comes in. Um, coral are not the, really the most stable organisms, and so they're able, uh, or they're going to die off pretty quickly um, if anything really drastic changes about their environment. So again, guys, that's just a quick survey of aquatic uh, biomes. We're going to dive much more uh, deeply into it. Uh, you guys are um, as you do your biome projects.